Good morning, fellowship. Good morning. Good morning, family. Come on in. Good to see everyone this morning. If you are able, let me invite you to stand for our call to worship. We'll read from God's Word through the Apostle Paul, 1 Corinthians chapter 11. This is the first 16 verses. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning at verse 1, the Word of the Lord. Be imitators of me, as I am of Christ. Now I commend you, because you remember me in everything and maintain the traditions, even as I delivered them to you. But I want you to understand that the head of every man is Christ. The head of a wife is her husband, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. But every wife who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head, since it is the same as if her head were shaven. For if a wife will not cover her head, then she should cut her hair short. But since it is disgraceful for a wife to cut her hair or shave her head, let her cover her head. For a man ought not to cover his head, since he is the image and glory of God, but woman is the glory of man. For man was not made from woman, but woman from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. That is why a wife ought to have a symbol of authority on her head, because of the angels. Nevertheless, in the Lord, woman is not independent of man, nor man of woman. For as woman was made from man, so man is now born of woman. And all things are from God. Judge for yourselves. Is it proper for a wife to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not nature itself teach you that if a man wears long hair, it is a disgrace for him? But if a woman has long hair, it is her glory? For her hair is given to her for a covering. If anyone is inclined to be contentious, we have no such practice, nor do the churches of God. The word of the Lord. Right. 
Great is the Lord King Jesus. See how his majesty is lifted high. Great is the one who saves us. Who is like our God, Lord, I lift you up. Great is the Lord King Jesus. See how his majesty is lifted high. Great is the one who saves us. Who is like our God, Lord, I lift you up. Which you wait, always the same, who is like our God. Salt the power of your majesty, who is like our God. King of kings, robed in glory, who is like our God. Who rule the world, love and mercy, who is like our God. Like our God. Great is the Lord King Jesus. See how his majesty is lifted high. Great is the one who saves us. Who is like our God, Lord, I lift you up. Destiny is in your hands. Who like our God, turn to you the hearts of men, who is like our God, conquered death, suffered the cross, who is like our God, gave your life to save the lost, who is like our God, who is like our God. Great is the Lord King Jesus, see how his majesty is lifted high. Great is the one who saves us, who is like our God, Lord, I lift you up. Great is the Lord King Jesus, see how his majesty is lifted high. Great is the one who saves us, who is like our God, Lord, I lift you up. destiny is in your hands who is like the furtherance of your church and your kingdom throughout the world that the gospel would go forth and that people would be saved father we thank you in jesus name amen amen uh, catechism Question number 41. What is the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. That's from Matthew chapter 6, verse 9, when the Lord Jesus is talking to his disciples, and he tells them how they should pray. We call it the Lord's Prayer. Perhaps a better name for it is uh, the Lord's Model Prayer, or the Modeled Prayer. It's not just Jesus praying, but he's teaching us how to pray, which is a good thing. Uh, how many times have you said, or I can't, can't even explain the number of times that I've heard believers say, well, I just don't know how to pray. Well, it's good news. Jesus has taught us how to do that. So just look at that. We, <laughs> I'm not going to start preaching because I could, but look at the first word <laughs> in, in this prayer, our Think about that for a minute. We're talking here. We're praying to the God of the universe. We've talked over the past couple of weeks. What should we pray? With what attitude should we pray? What is prayer? We're stepping into the throne room of God, and Jesus teaches us how to, how to pray. And the first word he uses is our Father. 
You ever thought about that before? You know, you, Jesus is teaching his people how to pray, and he starts off by telling us that we begin our prayers by talking to our Father. Isn't that amazing? I mean, don't, don't just skip past this, you know, we, we start praying, dear Heavenly Father, okay, and we just, that's just, you know, when you're writing a letter, you have to have some type of beginning to your letter. And so it doesn't really matter, hi, to whomsoever it may concern, or whatever type of letter you're writing. It's just there so that you can get on to talk about what you want to talk about in your letter. And I don't know if you think of it this way, but sometimes I'm praying and it just, well, I have to have a way to open up this sentence, so I'm going to say, dear God. Jesus starts off by saying, our Father. That's incredible. We're talking to the Father who is ours, and so he's talking on a personal level here. He's our Father, but then corporately together, he's our Father. That's amazing. We haven't even got to the, what the prayer is yet, and I'm not going to talk very long here, but that's pretty amazing, isn't it? Our Father, and then he goes on to say, hallowed be your name. That is May your name be made famous, which is our mission, isn't it? That's our mission in the world is to make famous who our Father is, that his name would be praised throughout the world. And then he goes on to say, your kingdom come. Our Father is king. My kids don't get to say that about me when they say, Dad, I have a question. We step into the throne room. Our Father in heaven May your name be famous. By the way, you are king. That means you have total authority, sovereign control over all things in the universe. May your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you can do that. And then there's really three things here that he walks us through in this model prayer that we can ask for, that we can talk to him about. Give us today our daily bread. We can depend on this God who is Father and King for the things we need. We probably don't think much about our daily bread, do we? Uh, well, there's sourdough, and there's white bread, and there's wheat bread, and there's rye, and I'm gluten intolerant, and so I need to this or that, or I'm on a diet. And we're blessed with all sorts of daily bread, aren't we? What's, what does he mean by daily bread? It's the things that we need every day. And we can go to God, our Father who is King, and ask Him for the things that we need. That's amazing. And then He says this. This is, this is both amazing and the most uh, humbling, scary, frightening part of this passage. Forgive us our debts, which is great. You stopped it right there, isn't it? But He says, forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. That we can be forgiven of our sins because of what he's done. And he's made us into a type of people who then go out and forgive others. And the expectation in this prayer is we're saying, God, we want you to forgive us in the same generous, gracious way that we're forgiving those who have debts against us. Man, it's hard to whistle into a mic because you just hear the, the, the air. How, how forgiving are you of how forgiving of a person are you? And would you go ask the Father that he would forgive you in the same way that you're forgiving of others? That's something to think about. And then the third thing, he says, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, that he, we can go to our Father in heaven, who's king, who's sovereign over the world, and ask him to guard us from sin and protect us from evil. So Jesus gives that to us as a model. doesn't mean when you sit down to pray that you have to pray this word for word. Although if you don't know what to pray, it's a good starting point. But here's some things to pray about. You have things you need to pray about in your life. How about what you need daily, that you would be forgiven of your sins, that he would help you forgive others, that he would protect you from sin, that he would guard you, that he would keep you from evil, and that you would that he would help you make his name famous in the world. That's pretty good, isn't it? We're going to sing now, Alas, and did my Savior bleed. <clears throat> Oh 
Christ the mighty maker died for man the creature sin. I, I hide my blushing face while his dear cross appears. Drops of grief can bury me. The dead above I owe. Dear Lord, I give myself away. It's all that I can do. Alas, and in my Savior. I can feel the eyes of heaven, the angels and the saints, all who've gone before us, surround us here today. Let's throw off every burden and lift up our gaze. Get caught in this story and lost in Everything that I need And if you listen close You'll hear heaven cheering for me Come on Come on Come on Come on Come on Come on Children In persecuted and restricted regions, people are responding to the gospel like never before. In a 90% Muslim nation, government officials visit Muslim Background Believers Ministry Center to thank the staff for their leadership with distributing thousands of masks and tons of food. Never in history has this happened. Children of God, be 
We are in unprecedented revival, reports SOM, International Contact. Tens of thousands of Bibles have been distributed. Venezuelans are praying for two million Bibles to share. Thank you for remembering us, said tribal Mexicans in the remote mountains after receiving many practical supplies. Over 150,000 masks produced and distributed. Over 2,000 house churches planted in unreached villages. No fear can shake us. No Over 90 believers baptized and 18 house churches established. All this happened in the first four months of COVID-19. That movie is from, or a video clip is from Spirit of Martyrdom to remind us about the International um, Day of Prayer for the Persecuted Church. And last week and this week, we typically take the time to um, view what God is doing around the world and see some of the persecuted people. But God is using all the persecution to bring himself glory and to bring more people to himself. And so we just want to take time to pray for our persecuted brothers and sisters around the world. Father God, we thank you so much just for our brothers and sisters around the world who are willingly to give up their lives, Father God, in many cases. Uh, and Father God, how you're just um, strengthening their faith and using them mightily. And Father, we pray you continue to encourage them and to provide for their needs. And thank you, Father God, that you're even using some of this persecution to bring many people to yourself. And so, Father, we just pray that you continue to grow your kingdom um, throughout this world. And Father, um, use us in any way possible that you can so that we can be part of your global plan around this world. And thank you for the many people that do have given their lives. And Father, we just continue to lift up their families for before you, Father God, and that you would take care of them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And now, um, some of you may be here last night um, when we had our speaker, Russell Stendhal Jr. Uh, I've known Russell for probably seven or more years. Um, I was down in Colombia with them when they had the showing and distribution of the La Montaña movie and taking around lots of villages there. And we, we saw that movie here. Many of you saw that. Um, he's involved in helping his dad, who his dad was the one that was captured by the guerrillas in the jungles of Colombia for about five months. And so Russell's lived through lots of that experience through his dad and he's involved heavily with the same ministry that his dad is in helping to distribute Bibles and work on the radio station to get the gospel message out to the people of Colombia and Venezuela, and especially to those in the, the jungles in the hardest to reach areas. So I just want to um, welcome uh, Russell up and to give us a message and challenge us. Good morning, everybody. I'm uh, very happy to be here with you guys today um, and joining with you guys in remembrance and um, honor of the persecuted church around the world. In Colombia, the Lord is moving like never before. In Venezuela, the Lord is moving like never before. In places like India, Africa, China, the Lord is moving like never before. And it's such a privilege that we get to 
hear about this. It's probably the, one of the only times in history where Christians from the other side of the world get to hear about what the Lord is doing in different parts of the, uh, in different parts of the world. Every Christian believer around the world is called to stand up for their faith, sometimes even suffer, be bound. And the only reason that that isn't happening here in the United States is because the Lord has given us this mighty privilege of, of freedom. And it's something that the church here in the United States has greatly impacted the rest of the world. We've sent missionaries out to different countries. We've sent pastors. We've sent resources. We sent um, money, books, Bibles, all throughout the whole world. And we have the eyes of the whole world looking at us, the eyes of all the church around the world looking at the United States and, and the eyes of the Lord himself looking at us and seeing how responsible we are with the privileges that he's given us. Um, I just wanted to start reading here uh, in Hebrews 11. Um, it says, Faith, therefore, is the substance of things waited for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtained a good report. Through faith we understand that the ages were framed by the word of God, that which is seen being made of that which was not seen. I grew up in Colombia as uh, just a missionary kid. I wasn't really, um, I, I really didn't have to like make the decision to like leave everything I knew behind and go to the, to the mission field. But I did grow up learning about um, stepping in faith, about maybe not seeing the full picture yet, or, or maybe not seeing God's full plan yet. And yet, seeing people like my dad step into the unknown because they felt a calling from the Lord to, to do that. And so... I'll, I'll tell you guys a little story of how my dad got to Columbia. My, um, my grandfather was a civil engineer up in uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he, uh, he had a good job. He, he um, had two vehicles at the time in, 19, in the 1960s. And, um, and then but one day he came home from work. And he decided that he wanted to teach my dad about missions. So he brought home a book. And he decided to, to um, show my dad this book and maybe get my dad interested in missions. And my dad was about four or five at the time. And uh, they started going through this book. And as they went through this book, this picture book, it didn't show what my grandfather intended to be shown, which was just nice pictures of Indian villages out in the remote areas of the world. But it showed the reality of how people lived. The drunken machete fights, the um, desperation, the hopelessness, all those things. And so as my grandfather was looking through this and realizing that this may be not a good book for a four-year-old, he started to try and close the book. And my dad just asked him, you know, why... Why do they live like this? And my grandfather said, well, I guess, um, I guess they don't know any better. My dad says, well, why don't they know any better? Well, I guess they don't know um, about Jesus Christ. Well, why don't they know about Jesus Christ? Well, nobody's going to, to, to tell them about him. Well, why hasn't anyone gone to tell them about him? So my grandfather says, well, I guess nobody really cares about those people. So my dad thinks for a bit, and he says, looks at my grandfather straight in the eye and says, well, you care, don't you, dad? 
And so the story goes that my grandfather got kind of nervous and was figuring out slowly that this is not the way that things were supposed to go. And so he kind of tried to bring it back to where he wanted it, which was to get my dad interested in missions. So he said, well, maybe when you grow up, the Lord will call you to be a missionary. And then you can go help those people. And uh, my dad was learning how to pray, and he knelt down next to the sofa and prayed in a loud voice and said, Dear Lord, please call my parents to be missionaries so I don't have to wait till I grow up. <laughs> and four years later, they were on a plane to Colombia to be missionaries to the very same uh, Indian people that they were looking at in that picture book. And it just reminds me of that story, just this verse, because... Back then, my grandparents didn't know everything about Colombia. They didn't know, you know, all of the flight schedules of, of that they were going to be able to go or come back to the States or if they were able to, um, if they were going to be able to receive any money or um, if they were going to have a nice place to live or anything like that. However, they felt the calling of the Lord and they decided to walk boldly in faith and do the will of God, or at least try to, the best of the abilities that they had. And so my dad grew up in Colombia. Um, they they, they uh, grew up with Wycliffe Bible translators, translating the Bible into different uh, native Colombian uh, uh, languages. And, um, and that's a whole other story of how the Lord blessed them and, and blessed what the, Lord, what, um, the work that they were doing with uh, the Kogi Indians in Colombia. And then my dad uh, was 28 years old, or 27 years old, I should say, about my age that I am now. And things start getting, started getting really rough in Colombia. There started being... Uh, terrorist groups that were terrorizing half the country, kidnapping people, um, killing people, killing pastors. Uh, an area about the size of North Korea in Colombia where church meetings weren't allowed, where pastors were persecuted and killed, church buildings were burned to the ground, Colombia for a while led in the most uh, martyred pastors than anywhere else in the world. And it was then that uh, a lot of these uh, missionary groups like Wyc Wycliffe, um, JARS, MAF, people like that started pulling out their missionaries from these really difficult areas because it was, uh, the terrorists would start um, targeting these big organizations. Uh, my grandparents and my father decided to stay in Colombia. And my dad was very, uh, very sad at all these missionaries leaving. And he was just asking the Lord, Lord, why don't you send missionaries to these, to these terrorists, to these Marxist guerrillas? Why don't you um, take the gospel to these to these people that are creating so much um, trouble and, and destroying all the work that, all the headway that it seems that we were making here in Colombia. And he was praying uh, for this fervently for, you know, a, a couple months. And sometimes we have to watch out what we pray for because after about three months of praying that prayer, he got kidnapped by the, the terrorist people, the Marxist guerrillas. And he was tied to a tree for five months. And the first days, he was just crying out to the Lord. He was saying, Lord, why, why did you do this to me? Why, um, why am I here? Haven't I done everything right? Have, there's, there's nothing in my conscience that... that gives an inkling that I deserve something like this. Why am I suffering? If there's something that I did, please, please let me 
know what I did so I can, so I can repent of it. And then the Lord showed him, well, you're the one praying for the gospel to be sent to these terrorists. And now you're there. Why don't you start sharing the gospel with them? And during his time in captivity there, he, he made friends with the people that kidnapped him. He changed um, his point of view of what the Lord requires of his people. Maybe it's not all... Um, Maybe he requires us to suffer a little bit to, to, to bring about his, his good plans, his good work. And when he was released, he felt the calling of the Lord to reach those same people that had kidnapped him. So he, after that, he decided that the only way to reach these people was through the radio, through FM, AM radio. And... Um, and that's what he did. And so I grew up in all of that. I grew up going out to the jungles, uh, uh, putting up radio stations where I thought maybe I shouldn't, we shouldn't even be there. And, um, and it was just crazy to see uh, my dad have a sense of, of faith in being called and doing what he's, he, he's required to do. I guess since he's already been kidnapped, he was like, well, what's the worst that can happen after that? But, um, but still, growing up in, in all of that, it was still, it was still very, very, um, it was very inspiring to see that. And a very hard challenge because Sometimes when you grow up as a missionary kid, you don't know, um, I don't know what it is, but it's like, you don't want to be like your dad, but, but you, you don't, but you, but you can also see the Lord like moving. And so you can't deny that the Lord is moving in, in these different ways. But even though I, I, I didn't want to be exactly like my dad, which we are a little bit alike because his name's Russell Stendhal. My name's Russell Stendhal. He's a pilot. I'm a pilot. So I guess we turned out pretty much the same either way, but as much as I tried not to be like him. But, um, but he, uh, but the, 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 the best thing that I, that I learned from him was to really step out in faith, maybe not knowing every single detail and maybe we're not supposed to know every single detail because we might be too afraid to to carry out the calling of the Lord has if we know every single detail about what's going to happen and so um so yeah we I, I grew up in in the mission field uh, I grew up going to uh the tallest mountains of Colombia to the to the most crazy jungles and uh, putting up radio stations and passing out Bibles. We, we've distributed around more than a million Bibles in Colombia, uh, more than 300, 3 million different uh, Christian books. We've uh, placed more than 50 radio stations across the country. And um, all the while we've done all those things by faith. We don't know if the, if the Bible that we give to someone, if they're going to read it or if they're going to sell it or, or what they're going to do with it. But we do trust that if we walk through the doors that the Lord is opening, that he's going to finish the work that he starts. Because it's a lot easier for us to do the work that the Lord is doing. And, and that work is eternal. However, if we try to come up with our own good plans and our own good intentions, then we're the ones that have to try to see that whole plan out, and that's exhausting. And, and many times we've had to stop a lot of our projects in Colombia because we're like, yeah, this isn't working. It's, it's, 
it might not be what the Lord wants us to be doing right now. Um, we've, along with uh, ra uh, radio stations and, and Bible distribution, we're also heavily involved with um, water, pur water purification plants that we've uh, begin to, to made available to different communities in Colombia and, um, and parts of Venezuela and Cuba. And uh, we've actually just sent another, uh, one of those water purification plants to India to Pastor Singh. And, um, and it's a great way to, to spread the gospel because everybody wants clean wa drinking water. And it gives us the ability to go into areas that otherwise would be um, maybe not very receptive to the gospel. And we're able to get in there with Bibles and books and literature. And uh, maybe even somebody wants a radio station and we help them set up a Christian radio station. Um, and so we do that. And then we also go, now we're involved with, uh, with Venezuela. The border of Venezuela and Colombia is one of the most dangerous borders right now in the world. It's, there's uh, drug trafficking human trafficking, uh, different terrorist groups, different gangs, and lots of people fleeing um, Venezuela in search for a better life in Colombia, the, U the United States, Ecuador, or Brazil. And, um, and right now we're trying to place, like the video showed, two million Bibles in Venezuela. And uh, right now, 30,000 Bibles are on their way they're on a, a barge headed to the Venezuelan border, which we can smuggle, in, smuggle them in. Uh, the border with uh, Colombia and Venezuela is officially closed, but um, by the grace of God, we've found ways to get the Bibles into Venezuela. And uh, the people over there are very receptive to getting a Bible. They haven't seen new Bibles in over 20 years. And uh, there's estimated about 11 million Christians in Venezuela. And it's like a 35 or 40 million person country. So a third of the country are Christians. And a lot of them don't have Bibles. Not even their Christian leaders have Bibles of their churches. And so the, the need for Bibles in Venezuela is great. And I, I would encourage you guys to go to uh, spiritofmartyrdom.com and see uh, where the needs lie and, and, and what you guys can do to to pray and to maybe um, uh, help as the Lord shows you guys. Um, so I'll keep reading here in Hebrews 11. Verse 6, it says, But without faith it is impossible to please God. For he that comes to God must believe that he is and that he is is a rewarder of those that dil diligently seek him. It's not just enough to believe in God. We can believe that there's God, that there's a God, but we also have to believe him, believe God, believe that his work is eternal, that he will bring about what he wants to do here on earth, that as it says here in verse three, that the ages were framed by the word of God. He framed all the ages. And we just have to walk in his faith, walk in his promises. Yesterday, um, I, uh, who saw the video of Pablo yesterday? A few of you. Pablo was one of uh, our um, best friends, and he was uh, martyred because of the gospel. He was, he was killed. And, but his wife, his amazing wife, went to the people that killed his, her husband, forgave them, and started evangelizing them. And a lot of them started to become Christians, and there's a whole revival going on over there. Um, in, in Colombia because of this. And we were able to get 
and all these Christians, once they start becoming Christians and leaving the, the native uh, religion, they start getting persecuted by their own people. And their persecutions isn't, uh, it can, can range from just being shunned to being tortured, to being whipped, to being um, killed even in some cases. And so a lot of these Christians uh, live segregated from the main uh, tribes and they uh, have no hope sometimes. And uh, partnering with people like uh, SOM, David Witt, and um, VOM Canada, uh, VOM Finland, uh, we were able to get some of these uh, persecuted Indian, uh, native Indians uh, a piece of land where they could call their home. And we're on the second one of these communities, about 80 or so families of Christian um, native Indians. And they... Um, and they have water purification plants, they have Bibles, and now they're going out and, and, and evangelizing the same uh, people that used to persecute them. They're going out and uh, really being an impact to what the Lord has shown them and standing up for their faith in these dif difficult areas of Colombia. And we just have to keep them in, their prayer, in our prayers because in, in Colombia, when I say a difficult area in Colombia, I mean that there's drug trafficking, mainly drug trafficking. And the, when people start becoming Christians in these areas, the Christians don't want to grow cocaine or they don't want to um, do any more of these illicit drugs. And so they become targets to, from all of these different uh, mafia groups. But these Christians don't, don't care. They're unwavering. They go into these places where, they're, where they might be persecuted or beaten or, or whatever, and they present the gospel and try to get more people to, to um, leave these uh, cocaine fields and, and things like that and, and start working for the gospel. So... It's, it's amazing to see all the things that the Lord is doing in Colombia and Venezuela. There's incredible revival going on right now. And if you turn on just like your normal news, you might not see it. But the Lord is working through all of these countries. He's working through all, all the world. And, and sometimes we focus on uh, Joe Biden or President Trump or, you know, whoever. And we don't see the good things that the Lord is doing throughout the world where he is really working and we have to believe him and have faith in him that he, everything that we are going through today is better for us in the long run and all these Christians around the world that are persecuted they're also being formed in the image of God and, and we also can be a part of all of that. Um, I'll continue reading in, in Hebrews 11. Um, verse 12. Therefore, there's, there's spring even of one, and him... As good as dead. Oh, sorry. Verse 13. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but seeing them afar off and believing them and embracing them and confessing that they were strangers and pilgrims on this earth. For those that say such things declare plainly that they seek their native country. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from which they came out, they might have had time to, ret to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, a heavenly one. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. So the Lord has prepared for us a city, and it's not an earthly city, it's a heavenly city. And once we realize this fact, that we're strangers and pilgrims on this earth, then I think we can better start 
to understand the true way of the gospel. It isn't for us to create king kingdoms here on earth. It's, as Pastor West was saying, for his kingdom to be done here on earth as, as it is in heaven. Once we start realizing that our citizenship isn't here on earth, we can truly be, start being useful for God in his kingdom wherever he chooses to make that. Going along here in Hebrews 11, and it says here, all of Hebrews 11 talks about how all these uh, fathers of faith throughout the Bible did all these things by faith. It talks about Abel, it talks about Abraham, it talks about Enoch, it talks about Isaac and Jacob and all these great men of God and how they walked by faith, stepped by faith, not seeing maybe the final end of God's promises, but still believing God when he told them that the promises were true and stepping into those promises. And it might sound good, right, like really nice for us right now and like, very uh, grand and, 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 and powerful. But then it comes here to verse 36, and it says, And others experience cruel mockings and scourgings, and added to this, and bonds and, impri and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain with the, with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, poor, afflicted, mistreated, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and in caves of the earth. And these all approved by testimony of faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better things for us, that they without us should not be made perfect. And then it continues here on Hebrews 12. Therefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, leaving behind all the weight of the sin which surrounds us. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us, with our eyes fixed on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who having been offered joy, endured the cross, despising the shame, was seated at the right hand of the throne of God, for consider him that endured such contradiction of sinners against himself, lest ye be wearied in your souls and fate. The Lord Jesus is the author and the finisher of our faith. Isn't that awesome? It means that he starts our faith and he will perfect it. And what we have to do is ask the Lord Jesus for more faith. He can give it to us because he will multiply his faith in us. So sometimes we think, well, maybe here in America we can't do much. Maybe we can't go out into the deepest jungles of Colombia and preach the word of God. But maybe not all of us are called to do that. Maybe some of us, and this is what I learned, heard, like sometimes I was afraid. I didn't want to do what my dad did just because I was just afraid to do it. And what the Lord taught me was, why don't you just sit here yourself and just pray? Pray, with, pray to me and I'll give you all the faith that you need to do the things that I require of, you, re require of you. And that's something I've slowly been learning. It's been a little bit hard, but it, I'm slowly learning that. And... And it's such a great promise to know that the Lord starts the work of faith in us. And that as we go through him, through everything that this world has thrown at us, he will finish our faith. Because he's the author and finisher of our faith. So I encourage you all to, to, to ask the Lord for, for the faith and for the belief in what he's doing. To be able to see not our own good plans and not our own good intentions, but actually 
see what the Lord is doing and where the Lord is moving. And instead of inviting the Lord to be in our plans, having the Lord invite us to be in his plans. And it's a much more fruitful way of doing ministry and doing missions. And... And a really good way to really be useful to the Lord. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much, Lord, for the privilege that we have to be here today, Lord, to worship together, to hear your word in our language, Lord. I just pray that you would give us all uh, your faith and your truth and your love, Lord, that we would be able to spread it across the our city, our nation, the world, Lord, that we would just be useful tools for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thanks, Russ. Appreciate it. I love, I love hearing these, these stories. Last night, he also uh, told us about uh, part of the radio program they have. They also use shortwave radios. And, you know, people ask them, why do you use shortwave radios? Who does shortwave radio anymore? And, and he said the reason they do it is because uh, the, the Marxist communist instruction that a lot of the government soldiers and stuff are getting comes over shortwave radio. And so their band is right next, right next to the uh, Marxist instructional band that the soldiers listen to. And it happens a lot of time when they're trying to tune in, they tune into their band instead. I thought that was, I thought that was cool. I love that. Uh, um, uh, there's a lot of creativity that goes into taking the gospel to the, to the whole world. And I love hearing the stories from Colombia and Venezuela. For, uh, you, you guys have seen Pastor Singh before he's been here. The stories that come from um, uh, uh, India and uh, Pastor Saidu is here. You, you've uh, listened to the stories from uh, South Africa and now Russell's here. You're hearing them from Colombia and Venezuela. Uh, and uh, whenever I hear these, uh, these men speak and talk about how the, the uh, Lord is doing a tremendous work in these, in these restricted, persecuted, uh, out of the way places, I always think of um, uh, the first six verses of Paul's letter to the Colossians, Colossians 1, 1 through 6, where he tells the Colossians uh, the same gospel that is spreading throughout the world and increasing is the same gospel that's working in you. And, uh, and so we can, be, we can be thankful for that. The, the stories, the gospel stories you hear these men and women bring and tell us, that is the same gospel that is at work in us, that compels us to uh, uh, um, talk about Christ and take Christ to a lost and dying world. And that's why we come to this table every single uh, week. Let me, let me read to you Paul's instructions in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. Paul says, for I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread. And, uh, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. That's what we're doing each week when we come to this table. We are proclaiming the Lord's death. We're looking back at the Lord's death and we are proclaiming it because it is the high point of the ages. It's what makes everything hang together. Uh, everything before Christ's death led up to it. Everything uh, after Christ's death flows from it. Um, uh, and so we look back to the cross, proclaim his death, and we do it until he's coming again. So you get that picture? We do this in the present time now with both a view to uh, Christ's first coming and a view to his second coming. We're celebrating what Christ has done in his death and resurrection. We are celebrating the gospel when we take this communion. We are celebrating the work that God is doing in the whole world and we are celebrating the work that God is doing in us uh, in our everyday lives. So um, we're gonna, I'm going to pray in a minute over these elements, but uh, what we're going to, uh, you, you know uh, the procedure. Um, we've got elements here and back on that table over there. I think it's just those two tables. Um, you can get them yourself if you don't already have them and uh, spend some time uh, praying just uh, talking with the Lord, take the elements at your leisure, and then the music team's gonna come up and lead us in some more music. Let me pray. Gracious and kind Heavenly Father, how we thank you so much that in your great wisdom in eternity past, before the foundation of the world, you decide decided to create us knowing uh, that we are going to uh, fall and rebel against you and you decided to uh, save, intervene and save a whole uncountable number of Adam's uh, race, Father, to uh, spend eternity with you. And so, Father, we thank you we thank you for your great salvation that you uh, have planned and executed and are still carrying it out, Father. We thank you for the way the gospel is advancing in the world and, in, and bearing fruit and increasing. And we thank you for the work that your spirit does in our own hearts, Father, using this very same gospel. And so, Father, we pray uh, that you would uh, make us uh, happy bearers of the gospel, happy proclaimers of the gospel, Father, and, and that your son would be exalted and you glorified as a result. And we ask these things in his precious name. Amen.
Can we stand? We will feast in the house of Zion. pray together. O oh Lord God Almighty, for the day that we are together in your presence, for the day that we no longer have to worry about sin, no longer have to worry about shame or viruses or pandemics or, or persecution, Lord, for the day that we can stand before you and say, you are worthy for the rest of our days, Lord. 
which is eternity, Father. I pray now as we go about our days that we would not be here in America forgetters of the persecuted church. May we be about praying, Lord. I pray now for those who are being persecuted, Lord, the persecutors who, as you say, do not know their right hand from their left, Lord, as you said about your city Nineveh, which you said, I will make you my children, Lord. May you be about the work of saving the sinners. May we be about the work of being a praying church, a praying city, a praying nation, Lord. Thank you that the effectual prayers of the righteous avails much. May we be about your work today. Be with us as we go. May we be uh, fellowshipping together. May we not forget each other. May we be, once again, a church that is wholeheartedly devoted to you and your work. May you be glorified today in everything. It's in your name we pray. Amen. You guys go ahead and be a seat. I realized I left my bulletin over here, so I'm going to grab it real quick. So just a couple of announcements before we go. First things first, um, in the back, if you have more information about Spirit of Martyrdom and want some materials, um, Brother Rick will have a table back there. He'll be there if you have any questions for him. Um, and there are plenty of things that you can grab. A couple of announcements. First of all, uh, speaking on prayer, there is plenty of prayer opportunities throughout the day. Uh, today, every Sunday, we have at about 9, 15, 9.30ish, our um, pastor, uh, prayer in the pastoral office. That's also on Zoom if you can't make it in person. And you are more than uh, welcome also to come up front and ask for prayer from the pastors uh, after the service is done. Uh, also, we have our 7 p.m. Wednesday prayer meeting. Lots of uh, opportunities. That is also on Zoom. Same link as the Sunday one. Um, speaking of the... Uh, going into new things, I suppose, uh, at 6 p.m. today, I believe is our first day in Revelation. Is that correct? Nice. So uh, this is our Sunday evening service. Uh, Pastor Mike will be heading that up. It will be at his house and also on Zoom. Uh, and that's the same link, I believe. Yeah, same link. Um, also, we have on November 5th, our new members class coming. Um, that'll be on the Sunday in the pastoral office. Uh, if you have any interest or are looking into that, talk to any of our uh, pastors. And last announcement, I know there were plenty, um, is our Operation Christmas Child, which is 16th through the 23rd. Um, we have the boxes in the back. If you want more info on how that all works, how that uh, goes down, and, and, and how to pack the boxes as well, there is a link in your bulletin that you can get and look into. I'll pass this to Pastor Wes.